This is marathon number 123. The previous video I released was marathon 124. So yes, I skipped a number. So I'm jumping back and I'm gonna, it's gonna be out of order in the uh, list of my videos, but I've, I can't skip a number. I think there's a number also somewhere back in the eighties, maybe I skipped. I may have to go back and do like marathon 82, I don't know. But I'm so scatterbrained and busy, I can't ever keep up with things and uh, keeping up with records is not my thing. So welcome to Marathon 123, where the host and narrator will more than likely mangle and mispronounce every location written in these stories, and pretty much butcher up the English language. So let's get rolling with the video. All right, here we go. Hey, y'all, my, my, one of my pit bulls is over here snoring, so y'all just don't pay attention to her. Don't pay attention to the snoring. Just listen to me. Listen to my voice. Here's an email I got uh, a few weeks ago, and I thought this was great. Hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, the writer's name is Jesse. You may use my name, Jesse. It doesn't bother me what others think of me. I guess that's what happens when we get older. I'm a 72-year-old woman, and I'm not into lying or making things up. I would like to tell you about one really clear male Sasquatch howl or roar that I heard. It left me dumbfounded for a long time. The TV show Finding Bigfoot came on TV, and I realized that's what I had heard. Here's what happened, and I guarantee that had I known what it was, we would not have spent the night in the same woods with this creature. In 2005, my husband and I were living in Wyoming. We had been cutting wood all day. He heats his shop with wood. It was getting late in the evening, but not quite dark yet. We crawled into the back of the pickup, and we were taking a nap before we cooked supper. I'm a very light sleeper, so I was lying there half dozing and half awake when all of a sudden this clear roar broke the silence. It was a lot like Bobo Fay on Finding Bigfoot, but this was far louder and clearer and it went on and on for what seemed like five minutes. Until I heard Bobo doing his howls, I had never heard a Sasquatch before, nor have I heard one like this one since. On another occasion in Wyoming, in the general same area, I was waiting for the guys to make it back to elk camp. I was getting dark, and I was getting bored there by myself, so I decided to try to call in some coyotes. I let out a long, clear yelp, and unexpectedly, a male Sasquatch answered my call. At first, I thought it was a human, but after thinking about it, I realized everybody was in their camps doing whatever they do. That's when I realized it was a Sasquatch that answered me. Another time, my husband and I got into a group of female Sasquatches and their young. There were a group of five adult females and an unknown number of young ones. I actually think there were infants in this group, too. The females went whooping like I call for my husband to help me. No human can duplicate that sound. It is so crystal clear and loud. There were at least five females within 50 to 100 yards from us. I called back in as close to the same tone and call, and boy, did they get upset. Even the younger ones began screaming at me. I've had many nights as a teenage girl laying in the bedroom window listening to their chirping and whistling and chatter down on the river that bordered our farm. It began when I was about 14, and it continued until I left home at 19. There's a controversy over what Sasquatch eats. I've come to the conclusion that they are omnivores. They eat whatever is available. In Wyoming, they would have to eat meat, elk, deer, and fish. But you would be surprised at how many plants all over North America are edible, even for humans. The plants we call weeds are probably good food for Sasquatch. 
Humans are so used to having others deliver our food to the grocery stores and restaurants that we've lost the art of hunting and gathering. The same plants that fed and nurtured the Indians are all still out there in North America. And normally I don't read this stuff, but (laughs) I just thought this was funny. Uh, People, you know, they'll add a personal message to me or whatever, and I hope she doesn't mind me reading it. But uh, she says, I hope you forgive some of my misspelled words. It's been a long, long time since I was in school, and my aging brain tries to do the best it can to remember. Well, Jesse, I'll forgive you if you forgive me for mispronouncing half the places that I talk about when people write to me. Uh, I can't pronounce anything. That's kind of America, unless you are unless you grow up. Hey, come down to Mississippi, some of y'all. Come down here and try to pronounce some of these places. I dare you. All you people who correct me you're with your little grammar, <laughs> your little grammar Nazi style, come down here and, and, and pronounce some of these words. I can't even pronounce them. Anyway, I'm just kidding with y'all. Uh, she writes, I hope you enjoy this. It was written to enlighten you and others a bit more. I enjoy your videos so much that I hope you keep them coming. You may not realize it yet, but you do have an audience just waiting for newer videos. I've listened to up to 119. I don't know how many you have done, but maybe in one of your videos you can tell us. I don't really know how many I've done, Miss Jesse. I think it's pushing 300, like 250 maybe, something like that. Maybe... I don't know, maybe closer to 200. I've never counted them. And that's funny because people ask me all the time, how many subscribers do you have? Friends of mine, I'm like, I don't know. I just don't look at it that much. I don't, what I care about is uh, doing a good video. That's really all I care about. And if I do that and you enjoy listening to it, then I've done my job. But about once a month, I look at all the stats and everything. And sometimes it's down, sometimes it's up. And I don't really care. I'm just having fun doing this. Okay, then she goes on to say, I have multiple scler- scl- I have trouble pronouncing this word. I have multiple sclerosis, and sometimes the only thing I feel up to doing is to sit in front of my computer and listen to you. I sit propped up on my pillow and drinking a cold mug of tea. You're a lot of company during this COVID-19 thing. Thanks for being there, signed Jesse. Well, thank you very much for saying that. And I you know, I don't call people. If I called everybody and said, thanks for the story, I would just be on the phone all day. And so uh, every once in a while, I want to read something personal. Someone writes to me, not that I've got this big ego because I don't, I really don't, but it's because I can't believe anyone would actually sit next to a computer and listen to my redneck voice tell these stories. And I call them silly, stupid stories. I know they're your stories. They're not silly, stupid But just in general, uh, you know, when people ask me about this channel, I'm like, oh, man, it's the stupidest thing in the world. But uh, we all enjoy it. Everybody likes it. So I just keep doing it. So, Miss Jesse, thank you for uh, letting me know. It's very encouraging to know people like listening to this. And I love you. and, And thank you so much for the letter. I hope you have a great Christmas. Here's an email from Benjamin. Benjamin writes, I've listened to your videos so much that I hear your voice as I'm writing this. Pretty cool, in my opinion. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, man. Pretty crazy. Sometime in the middle of the night between July 4th and 5th in 1996, I was driving from the Crawford Rodeo in Crawford, Nebraska. It's an annual three-day event with the finals held on the 4th, followed by fireworks and a dance. The big highlight of the night for me was getting to dance with Cody Rising, the new Crawford Rodeo Queen. My mind was still on the dance and that girl's beautiful smile as I drove through the Pine Ridge National Forest. Oh, those pretty smiles will get you, won't they, Ben? I made this trip many times in my life, traveling back and forth to my grandparents, so my mind wasn't exactly on my driving anyway. I did, however, remember to slow down at one particular sharp curve on Highway 2, where a friend of mine had rolled her van once. As I slowed to navigate both the curve and the hill it was located at the bottom of, something stepped out into the white line in front of me. I was driving a 1985 Nissan pickup, 
and I'm sure it was at least three feet taller than my roof, so maybe eight feet. It was covered in long black hair, and it stood there as if it was waiting for me to pass. It got its wish. I passed by and got the heck out of there. A couple of miles down the road, I had to pull over and stop. I needed to assess the situation and think about what I had seen. I could not wrap my mind around it, but I know it had to be a Bigfoot. I wasn't about to go back and check, but I'm 100% certain that what I saw that night was a Bigfoot. Over a decade later, at Chardon State Park near... No, no, it's Chadron. Over a decade later, at Chadron State Park near Chadron, Nebraska, I had another encounter. This time, it wasn't something I saw. It was something I heard. I was a troop master for the Boy Scouts at the time, up there getting ready for our spring camporee. The boys would be up in a few days, but I was there early in my camper. While we were there, the weather turned nasty, and a big storm rolled in. Even a mild thunderstorm feels worse when there isn't much between you and nature other than the flimsy sides of a camper. But this storm cracked the sky with long streaks of lightning and rattled the camper with heart-stopping blasts of thunder. Torrential rain pounded us and threatened to wash us away. It was so bad, my friend who was with us and who was a Vietnam veteran began experiencing flashbacks to bombing raids. I've actually seen that before. I've seen a Vietnam vet just about come out of his skin when lightning hits close. It's uh, it's really hard to see. There wasn't much we could do other than hunker down and wait it out and pray, maybe. As unsettling as all of this was and as worried as we were that we might not survive it, it turns out that wasn't the scariest part of the night. Right in the middle of Mother Nature's tirade between the rolls of thunder and above the sound of the pelting rain, my wife and I heard a sound. It was somewhere between a howl and a scream, and it pierced like a knife. It wasn't a coyote or a mountain lion or a bobcat or anything else I would have recognized. What it was was pissed off. It was like it was yelling at the sky to stop, but yelling like it thought it had the power to make it stop. I looked out the window trying to get a view of it because I was sure it was right outside of our door, standing right in the middle of our campsite. But I couldn't see anything through the rain. I guess I didn't need to see it, though. That terrible, long, angry wail was terrifying enough. Whatever it was, it probably didn't stay as long as I felt like it did. And the next morning, any evidence that might have indicated what it was was gone. It was washed away by the storm. But I'll never forget that sound as long as I live. The effect it had on my wife was profound as well. <coughs> Hank, Hank, what are you barking at, boy? A few years later, as we were heading up to Hot Springs, South Dakota near the point where the Ogallala Ogalala Ogalala National Grassland oh. ends. Chomp, why is everybody barking? Grassland ends and the Black Hills Forest begins. We had another uncomfortable moment. As we went into the forest area, a silence fell on us so heavy we could almost taste it. Oh. The, chomp, oh. chomp, chomp, hush. Y'all, I'm sorry. These dogs are crazy. Where was I? As we went into the forest area, a silence fell on us so heavy we could almost taste it. The feeling was so strong we pulled over and rolled down the windows. It was the creepiest silence I ever felt. No birds, no insects, no animals. Even the wind seemed to go still. My wife looked over at me and I could see the fear on her face when she said, I think there's a Bigfoot here somewhere. She'd never seen one, only heard that screamer during the storm that night. But I could see in her face just how deeply it had scarred her. Uh, you're welcome to use my name when you tell this story. I'd be honored if you did. As a side note, and something I'm kind of proud of, three of my four sons and I are Eagle Scouts. My fourth son is in the process of becoming one. 
You have a great day, Cam, and thank you. Well, Ben, Benjamin, I'm assuming people call you Ben. Thank you for that. And man, I'm so proud of you and your sons. And that Eagle Scout is hard to get. That it, it takes so much work to get that achievement. And congratulations to you and your boys. And I know the one that's earning his Eagle Scout right now, your fourth son, he won't quit because he's got three brothers. He's got to he's got to compete with those guys. So he's going to get it. You know he's going to get it. But Ben, thank you for this. It's a great story. And man, I really enjoyed reading it. And I know everyone else enjoyed hearing it. Thank you, sir. Here's an email from Colin. Let's see. Uh, I haven't read this. Let's see what he, let's see what he writes. It's 5.20 a.m. on Boxing Day. For you Americans, that's December the 26th. And I've just been watching your latest marathon video wherein you ask Europeans to tell you their stories. I don't know that I qualify as a European being a Brit, but I thought I'd tell you mine. In 1972, I was a young soldier fresh out of basic training, stationed at Salisbury Plain, England. Back then, we were under a threat from the IRA, so things were a bit tense. A general had been named as a target by then, and we had been sent to guard his house, staying in his shed in a huge garden. At about 0500, the sergeant told me to do one last check of the garden before we were relieved at 0600. So I took my standard issue L1A1 self-loading rifle and I headed out. I kept the magazine in my map pocket for safety reasons due to the fact that we were on a residential property. At 17, I still had a healthy imagination, not yet stunted by the horrors of life, so as I approached the bottom end of the garden where it was quite overgrown, I heard something approaching and my mind went into overdrive. Halt, I called. It ignored my command and kept coming at me. Halt, I yelled, and panic edging its way into my voice. The brazen creature, whatever it might be, completely disregarded my order. I hit the deck, fumbling on the ground to pull the magazine from my pocket, load the rifle, cock it, and point it. With all that racket, it was still coming at me. I caught my breath and braced myself in anticipation of coming eye to eye with the entire Irish Republican Army, or at least some monstrous fiend. The brush rattled and the undergrowth parted, revealing just beyond the tip of my rifle a fat, sullen-looking cat. The gasp that was waiting to escape my lips quickly turned into a sputtering laugh as I mentally rebuked myself for being so foolish. Me taken by a cat. That's one I wouldn't be sharing back at headquarters. I never told the NCOs. I was new to the unit and I didn't want to give them a reason to ridicule me. And I'm only telling you now because I thought it would be nice to share a laugh together. <laughs> I know you probably won't use this story, but I hope it at least made you smile. You can hear me laughing, Colin. Keep up the great work and please don't change the format. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. A great new year to you and yours. Uh, Sign Colin. Oh man, I thought that was a Bigfoot story, but I don't care. That's a great story. That's an awesome story. Colin, thanks for taking time to write it, man. I'm so glad people think to write me things other than Bigfoot stuff. It's real interesting to me. And we get little life experiences from people, and it's awesome. Colin, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Merry Christmas. Here's a short little story from Link. Uh, he's from Eufaula, Alabama. He writes, I grew up in Eufaula, Alabama. Very nice, small, quiet town back in the day. There wasn't anything to do except hunt or fish. I was 13 when this happened. I'm now 48. Me and my dad went for an afternoon hunt off old Batesville Road. He dropped me off at my stand, which was an old 2x4 ladder stand, 12 feet high. And then he went on to his spot. It was that time of day called twilight. The sun was going down and it was a beautiful afternoon. I heard something down in the bottom to my left, and when I turned my head, I saw a set of yellow eyes coming out of the bottom. I didn't have a flashlight, so I knew there wasn't any artificial light source making the eye shine. The eyes came out of the bottom and onto the ridge where I was sitting. 
It stopped about 25 yards from me, and it started watching me for what seemed like hours, but it was probably only just a minute. It then turned and went back down into the bottom in the direction from which it came. A few minutes later, my dad was out on the road hollering for me to come, and he was saying, let's go. When I got to him, I told him what had happened, and all he could say is that, son, I've seen things here that I can't explain either. Just don't be scared of it or you'll never enjoy hunting again. I found out later that he was right. Four years passed and we were at Christmas dinner at my grandmother's house. All the kids were sitting around the table. Remember, at this point, I was just 17. My brother was messing with me about the Bigfoot encounter. We got through eating and we went out on the porch, all of us guys, and we were talking about hunting. And my grandmother opened the door and she says, Lincoln, come here. I go by Link, but when somebody calls me Lincoln, which is my real name, I'm usually in trouble. I don't know why that cracks me up. Oh, it's just like that for everybody. Just like that for everybody. Okay. She told me to sit down at the table. She had something to tell me. Now, my grandmother retired from an adolescent center in Eufaula. She got off one night, and she made a left turn onto Highway 30 off of Outback Road. After she made the left turn, this huge hairy man, as she called him, walked out in front of her car and stopped and stared at her. She said this thing was huge, and it scared her to death. And then she told me that I was the first person she had ever told that story to because she knew that people would laugh at her like all my cousins were laughing at me that night. At the time that she had her sightings and I had mine, they were basically only a day apart. Only three miles separated the location of our sightings. Thanks for your time. Keep up the good work and come to Lake Eufaula and drown a minnow or a cricket. Won't be long for the crappie are starting to run again. And I think the crappie bite all year. They do down here, Link, but you already know that. Some people just don't like getting out in the cold, including me. But sometimes them crappies are calling my name. Okay, so that was a great story, Link. It just confirms there's, you know, you and your grandmother. Look, your grandmother's not going to say something like that to you just to make you feel better she's going to rub your back she's going to say she's going to say don't don't let them make you feel bad don't let them laugh at you don't worry about it you know what you saw you know what your grandmother's going to say but she's not going to say i saw one too that you're, you're never going to hear that so it makes this story all the more believable link thanks for the story man we all enjoyed it have a merry christmas this is an email from Stephen. Back in August of 2006, I joined my eldest son on a 50-mile hike with his scout group. They needed a few adults to go along, and I figured it would be a good time in the wilds of Utah. I work in the construction trade. Unfortunately, the day before we left, not only did I twist my ankle, I managed to get a chunk of drywall in my left eye. The doctor said I should take it easy, use the eye drops he prescribed, and wear a patch for a week. When I mentioned the hike, he said that it wouldn't be a good idea. So knowing the hike would be canceled for lack of adult supervision if I couldn't go, I did what guys do. I went. We were to hike the Beaver Mountains, more specifically Mount Shelley Baldy. We started at a place called Big John's Flat. We crossed a creek and went up and around to a place called Blue Lake. We averaged going up and down a few thousand feet in elevation every day. We walked through aspens and pines and through meadows and along clear creeks. We saw signs of bear and other animals along the way. About halfway through the week, we hiked up a high switchback trail that put us at 9,000 feet. The sun shining through the aspens above us was beautiful. We came to a place where an avalanche had mowed down acres of trees like toothpicks. A large old pine had fallen across the trail, and we had to make our way around it. During this time, I was walking rear guard with a few of the less physically active boys. 
One of the boys had to answer nature's call, so another boy and I stopped to wait for him. The rest of the group moved on, and I told the boy waiting with me to go on and catch up, and I would stay and wait for the other boy. I sat alone on the trail, looking around me at the piles of trees brought down by the avalanche, along with other deadfalls one finds in the forest. But soon I saw the boy that I'd been waiting for take off running. We were on a switchback trail, so I assumed he must be taking a beeline to catch up, and I started my own hike to do the same. I had not gone but a few yards when suddenly the quiet solitude of the peaceful remote forest was shattered by a loud noise. It came from behind me and then above me. It wasn't like it was in the trees, but like it was larger than me, much larger. It was a strange noise for the forest. If I had been in a mechanic's shop, I could have easily understood the sound and why I heard it, but this sound was incredibly loud. It was as if the hose was suddenly cut on an air compressor at 200 PSI, letting all the air rush out at the same time. All I could do was just stop in my tracks. I was surprised, yet I also understood what could be in these mountains. I am from the Pacific Northwest. I know about the cryptids people call Sasquatch and Bigfoot. A frozen place, all alone in the knowledge that the others must be 15 minutes ahead of me. There was no way to call for help. I was all on my own. All the hair on my body stood up like I was in an electrical storm. Yet I chose not to run. If whatever was behind me had the predatory prey instinct and I ran, then that would make me the prey and I had no desire to be on the negative end of that scenario. Years later, having listened to David Pilates' missing 411 interviews, I counted all the points that matched up with this situation, and I'm glad I was not added to any of the missing 411 Utah listings. What does one do when miles from anywhere, all alone, faced with something unknown? My first instinct was to pray and ask our Heavenly Father for guidance and safety. I made promises in return for his help with the creature behind me. I then spoke in my head and out loud to whatever was back there. I said that we were just passing through, that we weren't going to stay, and if allowed to go unharmed, I would not come back. The only weapon I had on me was a walking stick and a 16-inch bowie knife. As I spoke, I slowly unsheathed the knife, saying, You may kill me if you want to, but I'm going to hurt you. This is going to cause a deep wound in you, and I'm going to go down fighting, but I prefer to just be allowed to move on. Everything returned to quiet. I don't know how long I stood there. What seemed like seconds could have been minutes. Finally, I got the courage to turn and face my nemesis. I made a slow circle to the left, scanning the whole area with my one good eye. A hundred men could have been hiding in those fallen trees, and they would not have been visible unless they wanted to be seen, even with two good eyes. So I had to accept whatever was out there had either left or was now hiding. I turned my back around and began to hike up the trail. I half expected an attack from behind at any moment but there was a peaceful calm over the area now. I walked about 30 yards and I put the knife back in its sheath. The group had stopped to wait for me and eventually I caught up, but I didn't mention the incident because I had no desire to spook the boys. A couple of the boys were from out of state. We hadn't even mentioned to them about the bears earlier, knowing that would freak them out and make them want to go home. Some things can wait to be told when wisdom dictates, if ever. Nothing else happened until the last night of the hike. We were up around 10,000 feet at a place called Twin Lakes. Looking down from above, they resembled a pair of old-timey eyeglasses with a small stream connecting them across the bridge of the nose. It was a wonderful and remote hike-in-only place. At 10 a.m. that night, as the scouts sat around the campfire singing and talking and doing what scouts do, 
I began to realize a familiar sound off in the distance. It was a long, low howl like the call of an Ohio Sasquatch I had heard a few times online. It was off in the distance, in the direction where I had been invited to leave their territory. I think whatever it was was telling me that it was not pleased that we had walked through its lands. Pioneers in this area had named a canyon not far from where we were, Gorilla Gulch. Monroe Mountain in the same area has a place called Monkey Flats. I have since heard tales from locals of other encounters they've had. My conclusion is that it's most likely Sasquatch. From that day to this, I have never returned to hike that particular path on the southwestern slope in the Aspen Forest of Mount Shelley Baldy. I'm not one to go out and seek these things, but I do seek answers. This spring, while hiking along the Monroe Mountain with two of my young adult children, we came across a teepee-style structure that hadn't been there before. There was also a tree about 12 inches in diameter pushed over and snapped at the base with no sign of it rotting. I also discovered a barefoot track larger than my size 13 boot frozen in the snow by a creek bed. This area being close to my home, I have begun to revisit it and have discovered a place to study these critters we call Sasquatch. This group seems non-aggressive, and they've allowed me to roam their land, take photos, and learn a little bit about them. As time progresses, I hope to gather a unique evidence. Where they rest during the day and sleep at night, where their little ones play, and where to look into the deepening shadows to find them. What are they? Flesh and blood? Male and female? They mate, they have children, they're similar to us, They live and play and study what is around them. I'm sure I offer them free entertainment from time to time. And do they have special abilities? They might. Are they curious? Yes, I believe they can be. What is yet to be untold will be interesting, but it will take patience and time. Stephen, that's a great story. I'm glad uh, I'm glad you didn't have a 411 incident in Utah with that thing behind you. Glad everything worked out pretty good. And you, like all the others who encounter something like this, become consumed with it. And you spend a lot of time in the woods trying to find out what these things are. Appreciate the story. We all enjoyed it. Merry Christmas, Stephen. I'd like to end this video up with a Christmas story written by my good friend Tobin. Watch a prig is a small town. Not much happens in this small Virginia town. The place is known for the fishing and the tall tales. Many tales come from the men of the area. The majority of men make their living on the waters. One tale, which to this day has yet to be explained, happened on Christmas Eve, 1872. The men of the Emmeline S., a stately fishing boat, had just returned from their usual daily sea hunt. The catch of the day netted nothing more than a few dogfish and a few shrimp. Maybe it had gotten too cold for the oysters this season. The talk of the day centered around the lousy catch. Dogfish, who the hell wants a baby shark for Christmas? The men lingered a while at the Fox Pub and then decided to head home for Christmas. Lewis and Sarah Heath had lived alone for some time now. Their two sons had grown and moved away. Lewis had the water, and Sarah stayed busy with her church. Their home had always been a scene of joy and excitement at Christmas in the past, but now the kids had moved away and Christmas changed as they got older. A cold wind blew off the Atlantic and the sky filled with ominous snow clouds. Tonight was going to be a cold one. Lewis went down to his boathouse to do a last-minute check on his riggings. The Emmeline S. was his pride and joy. And then, as if an unexpected nor'easter had hit the shores, a wind blew the boathouse doors open. When it died down, Lewis wiped the dust from his eyes. 
and standing in the doorway were three small puppies, shivering and wet from the falling snow. "'What have we here? Where did you fellas come from?' said Lewis. "'I can see you need a place to spend the night.' Lewis looked around the boathouse, and he found an old wooden box. In it, he placed some used sail material. "'That ought to get you through the night.' I'll have the missus bring down some grub for you. You look hungry. Lewis closed the doors and went into his house. Sarah, we have company. Have you got any stew left? What on earth are you talking about, Lewis, replied Sarah. There are three small, cold, and hungry puppies in the boathouse. Lewis almost smiled. But where did they come from, Sarah asked. I have no idea. We'll find out tomorrow. It's becoming a blizzard out there. After they fed the pups, Lewis and Sarah went to bed. At 2 a.m., the first noise woke Sarah. She sat straight up in bed. Did you hear that, Lewis? Listen. The noise was growing louder. Lewis jumped out of bed and took up the fireplace iron on his way out the door. The noise was coming from the boathouse. He discovered the noise was coming from the puppies. They were wrecking the whole place. They had found a box filled with old Christmas decorations and had strewn them everywhere. Sarah appeared at the doorway to see Lewis shaking his head. What a mess. Lewis, maybe they're trying to tell us something, Sarah said, laughing. Maybe they think we should put these pretties up. After all, it is Christmas. And since the boys left, we don't celebrate Christmas like we used to. It's 2 a.m., Lewis replied. Oh, well, maybe you're right. I can't sleep now anyway. They finished putting the last ornament up when they heard a knock at the door. Lewis joked and said, Now, I wonder who that could be. I wonder if it's those puppies and they want to see the decorations. Lewis opened the door and there stood their oldest son, Alonzo. He had not been home in four years. He had joined the merchant ship USS Olivia and had been away for its sea. Lewis and Sarah spent several hours talking with Alonzo. They told him about the puppies that had taken refuge in the boathouse. After a while, the three of them headed out to the boathouse to see the puppies. The sun started to peek over the Atlantic and turned the night snowfall into a glistening blanket. As the three moved toward the boathouse, the sound of a horse and carriage broke the early morning silence. Coming down the lane was their youngest son, Ivan. They all greeted and hugged. Lewis mentioned the puppies again. They opened the wide doors of the boathouse, and there was no sign of the puppies. The boathouse was clean. Even the wooden box Lewis had put down for them was in its original place. This is really strange, Lewis said. Maybe they were angel puppies, Sarah suggested. How else can you explain it? All through the day, they remarked about those strange little visitors. At noon, the annual Christmas pageant began at the church. The story of Christmas and the birth of Jesus was recited. And then Lewis told the congregation about the puppies. He asked if anyone had an explanation. No, no one could provide one. Maybe it was just one of those little miracles that God gives us now and then. Lewis and Sarah took the time to help the puppies. In turn, the puppies gave them back the true meaning of Christmas and a reason to celebrate. Many years have passed. Lewis and Sarah have long been gone. But every year at Christmas, the people of the little town of Wachaprig show their best effort to decorate and celebrate Christmas. After all, legend has it, those Christmas puppies will turn and pull out your Christmas decorations anyway. The end. Oh, I just thought it was a great little Christmas story. Thanks, Tobin. I appreciate you sending that to me. And we come to the end of another video. I'm going to try to get another one up by Christmas, and I think I can. But if I don't, Merry Christmas to everyone. I hope you have a great holiday and a new year. We'll see you just as quick as I can get another video up. Merry Christmas, everyone.